Hello and welcome to the Wingate Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Martha Asty, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Wingate University. In this episode of the Lecture Series, it's an enlightening look at how business works. Dr. Dennis Harlow, an Associate Professor in the Porter B. Byron School of Business, is speaking about corporate strategies and Porter's five forces, the five forces that drive a business. If you have a company you want to grow, one you want to start, or you're just interested in making money, You'll enjoy this installment of the Wingate Lecture Series. Let's join the discussion now. Today we're going to cover a couple items that uh, I think need a little bit of reinforcement uh, for the final exam, so we're going to cover those again. Uh, the two items are corporate strategies and Porter's Five Forces. This has also been posted to Moodle, so if you want to, you can go and follow along if you want. Uh, you also could, in fact, uh, pull the slides. I'll, pu I'll put the slides up. I think the slides are up there already, actually. There's, there's uh, several documents covering this, so you might want to take a look at those before we get to the final exam. Uh, again, the strategy and policy is the course name. And uh, we're going to talk about corporate strategies and Porter's Five Forces. The first one I'm going to talk about um, is corporate strategies, and this is about industry analysis, specific industries, uh, in particular uh, a firm's uh, impetus and where it's, it intends to compete, industry analysis, as opposed to uh, general or political, economic, social, cultural, technological, demographic, or globalization. Corporate strategies, three types directional, parenting, and portfolio. And in the book, it breaks these down uh, fairly well, and we've gone through these a few times, but it's still a little confusing. I understand that. Uh, because within the directional strategy, there are three types. The first one being this growth strategy. Okay? Um, so we have growth, stability, retrenchment, within these directional strategies. The first one being growth. Uh, and this is a, you can have several of these, one of which is concentration in an industry, either vertically, going back uh, to uh, in the value chain, backwards in the value chain, or forward in the value chain, or horizontally expanding into new ge ge geographic markets and that kind of thing. Uh, you also can have diversification or not diversification strategies, uh, a related diversification or unrelated diversification, expansion into a related industry when the, even when the industry attractiveness is low. And the reason you can do this is simple. It's because you have already built up competencies within that industry that enable you to go in that industry and compete at a high level. In related, the company's product or processes are related to the target industry. We talked about pumps and motors in the past in this, in this class. And again, it should be related because they kind of go together. So a company could get into a related diversification if they were a pump manufacturer by manufacturing motors. Very related to, to the overall industry and, and concentric. Uh, they have a common thread. I say that in here. This is also listed in the book on page 214, so you want to look there. Uh, there's a better explanation or a more, more uh, detailed explanation. Uh, conglomerate, unrelated diversification. The example I gave was General Electric. GE has, got, has gotten uh, a number of divisions, has a number of divisions. Those divisions include plastics, appliances, jet engines, Totally unrelated. Medical products is another. Totally unrelated to one another. The idea there is similar to a portfolio of stocks. If you have dissimilar stocks in your portfolio, you minimize risk. And when one business is in the downturn, appliances because home building's down, another business, jet engines for instance, might be in the upturn. So you have a couple ways of smoothing out that growth in profits so that you're not in downturn all the time if your business was just appliances. 
a conglomerate strategy. Um, it basically, your core competencies or your competencies in that particular industry are not going to enable you to, to expand as rapidly as you'd like. General Electric has a competency in management and that's what they use to do this conglomerate um, unrelated diversification for growth. Okay. So you have a growth strategy, unrelated conglomerate uh, strategy for growth. Blue ocean strategy, something I haven't mentioned in class until today, <laughs> uh, was a, is a strategy and it basically says we're going to grow, we're not going to do concentric, nothing related, it's not even going to be so much unrelated, it's going to be in an entirely new industry, something where we have no competition, no competition exists. Apple's iPhone is one of those uh, companies that's gone into an area, no competition in the smartphone arena at the time the iPhone was first developed and first brought to market. Mergers and acquisitions, that's another one where you can buy another company. That's growth. That's a growth strategy. Just get bigger by acquisition. Uh, banks do this all the time. Um, other industries, steel industry does that. Uh, auto industry, Fiat just bought Chrysler Corp. And in doing so, they grew by mergers and acquisitions. They acquired Chrysler. Organic growth is simply grow with the market, but grow at a greater rate than the market by leveraging your core competencies. A stability strategy, again, continuing with growth strategies. Uh, pause, proceed with caution. You're not trying to take any risk. Just keep it even steel, even Steven, even um, kind of uh, growth pattern. Don't really rush ahead with new ventures or new investments. And you do that during a recession often. Uh, no change, just don't change anything. You know, your strategy pretty much stays the same. You don't go into new markets, new products. You attempt no big initiatives. Try to gain profit in this stability area. And that's another strategy or, or uh, connector to the stability strategy. You should have profits that you're constantly looking at to maintain. You're trying to set the stage for later growth with a stability strategy. And finally, in the growth strategies, or the, excuse me, not the growth strategies, but the directional strategies, the directional strategies would be, again, retrenchment. So stability strategy, directional, Retrenchment strategy, directional, and the, the retrenchment strategy would be turnaround, a turnaround simply doing things much differently than you've done in the past. I gave the example in class, I think, of Al Dunlop at uh, Sunbeam. He went in and simply fired everybody he could, and immediately the company turned around. Well, unfortunately, they couldn't make any new products so that became a problem down the road. But for the first year or so, things looked really good. It looked like he'd really executed a turnaround. Uh, captive company, become a captive company. Sell the company wholesale to another company in the industry and just become a captive. And that's a retrenchment strategy. When things aren't working, you don't have enough money for investment, sometimes you'll sell the company sell off the, uh, parts of the company or divest, that's another approach. And then finally, another directional strategy. Now, direction, growth, stability, retrench. So you're trying to take the company down to a lower level. Bankruptcy and liquidation, that could be the final stage of retrenchment. And you just go out of business and distribute the assets to the creditors and the shareholders. Now. There's growth strategies, there's portfolio strategies, and the portfolio strategies, uh, they're a little different in the sense that they treat each business as an investment, like a portfolio of stocks. So those businesses that have the best return or potential return get the most investment. 
Remember us talking about uh, question marks and stars and uh, cash cows and dogs, which is the Boston Consulting Group model. And the stars get investment. The question marks, well, you don't really know, but you're probably going to have to invest. And the market attractiveness is growth. One of the things is growth. And market share, current market share. So those are the two parameters that you look at in order to determine whether or not to invest in the businesses. Those are two popular types of portfolio analysis. Each one is taken as a part of your portfolio of businesses. Dogs at the end sold off, divested, because they no longer provide profit uh, to build the company and make those other parts of the portfolio successful. It's basically to see it's similar to a portfolio of stocks in that you invest in those that make money or have potential to make money. That pretty much covers those three major corporate strategies. One that I hadn't covered in that uh, bit of a lecture is the parenting piece. And parenting goes like this. You take those competencies that you have in your other company and you spin off new businesses using those same competencies. Parenting, same capabilities. GE does this when they, when they buy a business. IBM does this when they buy a business. They're using their management competencies, their financial management competencies, their technical competence to birth a new child business, birth a new child business. And I didn't do a separate slide on that, but that's those three corporate uh, strategies, directional, parenting, and portfolio. Uh, Porter's Five Forces, the reason that you do this, it's for industry analysis again, the reason that you do this is to determine, what do you determine? Industry attractiveness. Industry attractiveness. If you don't have any other comment about this as to why you do it, that's it, that's it. You're trying to determine if that industry is attractive enough for you to invest in or to start a business in. And companies do this all the time. And Porter's uh, topology is used extensively, not only for, for industry analysis, but also for, for buying stocks and understanding stocks. So managing your portfolio, you could actually use this as well. Um, New markets and product lines. That's what you're trying to determine. Should you go into this new market? Should you develop this new product line? And this allows you to use some various parameters to assess. Um, also, one of the other things that industry analysis and Porter enable you to do is it enables you to take a look. If you're competing with a company, for instance, you're competing against Samsung, and they're competing against you in semiconductors, and you try to compete against them in every market that they serve. You have multi-market competition. Often you'll use this five forces to determine if you could go and compete against a competitor that's competing you, with you in many other industries and markets. So it has some useful usefulness as that, uh, from a standpoint of where are we going to compete? How, how much are we going to invest? You know, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is a chart, and this is kind of a chart that is relatively uh, uh, new to the class, but it's also something that, we've, uh, that I've used in the past. Uh, you can t determine the threat of new entrants and barriers to entry, and if they're low, uh, all of these things, competitive, competitive rivalry is low, power of buyers is low, power of other stakeholders is low, power of suppliers is low, and threat of substitutes is low, guess what? The market should be fairly attractive if you can, in fact, erect barriers to entry, or you can give, your, give yourself some competitive advantage. Now, we talked about Porter's five forces. There are actually six. Another's been added. And we'll talk through these um, specifically. And again, these are in the book. Uh, so you can actually go through and check out these things, as well as being posted on Moodle. 
threat of new entrants. Now, the threat is ameliorated by the fact that you have these barriers to entry. So if there's a barrier there, it's not easy to get into the market. Often you're going to say, well, let's not, let's not go into this market or let's do because we can erect a barrier. Our company has the ability to erect a barrier through many of these kinds of things. Scale economies is one way to erect a barrier into a market and here's how this goes. If it takes $5 billion to get in the semiconductor chip making business, which it does, that's a huge barrier to entry. If you need to make a billion of these semiconductors per year and have this $5 billion plant, that's a barrier to entry because not all companies can do this, nor will they take the risk unless they're assured you're not going to compete with them. So that's a barrier to entry. If product differ differentiation is very high, product differentiation is high uh, as a barrier to entry, often even if you enter the market, they don't care. Companies or uh, customers just don't care. Let me give you an example. Um, highly differentiated market for cars in Europe, especially in Germany, uh, Mercedes, Audi, VW, uh, BMW. You can enter that market all you want to, but the product differentiation keeps the threat of new entrants very low. The reason being, many competitors just can't compete with German engineered cars in Germany. Capital needed to enter, I mentioned that with scale economies, $5 billion plant. Switching costs. If you're working with Microsoft Office, for instance, working Microsoft Office, and someone comes in and says, I've got a great deal for you. We can go to, to Linux and we'll give you word processing, uh, spreadsheet, presentation, graphics, all kinds of things that you might want at half the price. Well, it sounds great until you understand switching cost. Switching cost means that you cannot switch because everyone else uses it. The switching costs are high for training. You've got to learn it. The, the, the folks in your firm have got to learn it. So that becomes an issue. Uh, access to distribution channels. You can uh, have products that will not allow you access. There's a barrier to getting into the distribution channel. Just the way the product's distributed. In Japan, these are a multitude of, of barriers. Products in Japan are distributed through middlemen who then will make a decision on whether or not to allow a non-Japanese product into the distribution channel. Often the answer to that is, no, we won't. Um, cost disadvantage is independent of size. It's a preferred or established product. Ease of use is established. It's a product that everybody's familiar with. Uh, it has a huge uh, market share. Why would you switch? Well, there's gotta be a compelling reason or government policy. I've often thought about operating Harlow's power station out here in Wingate. And the, the problem with that is they won't let me set it up. I know how to do it, I think. They just won't let me do it. And the reason is that Duke Power has a monopoly on power generation in this area of North Carolina. What's that mean to me? I'm not going into the power business. I am regulated out by the government. Rivalry amongst existing firms. It depends a lot on number of competitors. A uh, small number of competitors leads to matching moves. So if you have a small number, it's only three competitors or four. Every time you make a price increase, they do too. Every time you reduce your price, they do too. So there's no van advantage and rivalry tends to be very high. If there's a multitude of competitors, many, many, that doesn't happen because it's hard to keep up with what's going on in the market. If the rate of industry growth is low, you're in the mature end of the product life cycle or market life cycle, then you're st starting to see a leveling off of the market and then decline occurs. So fewer and fewer competitors grabbing the same or less market share. If capacity in the market uh, increases in large increments. In other words, if a plant that's being built 
adds 20 or 25 percent of the capacity to the market, that creates intense rivalry because someone's got to fill that plant. They've got to fill that plant with sales in order to make it economic. And so when large uh, capacities start to be added, it makes for a much more intense rivalry. Exit barriers. Um, brewing industry, they talk about brewing industry and that's an exit barrier because the equipment is specialized for breweries. So you're making beer, those, that equipment can't be used for doing other things. Can't bake bread with it. So you have a limit to what you can use that facility for. That's a huge exit barrier. Global competitors compete in same locations and same markets. I talked about that a second ago. These global competitors compete in all these different industries and markets. Siemens is a global company, GE, Samsung, global company, multiple products, conglomerate organization. Uh, threat of substitutes, I, off, I give you the example of tea and coffee, tea and coffee. When the price of coffee gets too high, people switch to tea because it gives the same benefit, which is what? What do you get from? Caffeine and energy, of course. So you get caffeine and energy, and so at some point it's better to go to tea. And I've noticed the price of coffee has really uh, risen lately, haven't you? Yes, it's really gone up. So I'm thinking about switching this morning. Uh, I've got about two big bags of coffee left, and when it's gone, I may switch to tea because the price is just getting out of hand. Um, tea for coffee, fax for email, well, not so much anymore, um, but an email attachment would probably be better than a fax. Uh, internet for video stores, you're getting your, inter you're getting your video off the internet. Uh, who has uh, Hulu and, and all of these other, Hulu? Online uh, internet sources for movies, okay? A lot of people get their movies off the internet now. This limits prices as well. You can only charge so much and people stop paying. They go to something else if there's a substitute product available. Is there any substitute for airlines? Well, there are, but they tend to be just as expensive and, a mu and much, much longer to, to get somewhere. Buses, that's a substitute. They tend to be cheaper, but you don't want to go from here to LA on a bus. Not unless you have a death wish. Okay. Bargaining power of buyers and suppliers. Uh, bargaining power of buyers. Buyers have the ability to force down prices, bargain for better quality, play competitors against one another, and th they're powerful if. So those, that top line is how they manage that power. And these are some ifs. If they buy a large proportion of your, of your goods or services, if they can integrate backward and take over the business of supplying what you supply, if alternative suppliers are plentiful because product is undifferentiated, they can go somewhere else, buy the same thing, not much of a differentiation. Uh, purchase product represents a large proportion of that buyer's uh, costs, then the incentive is to vertically integrate backwards and actually bring that in-house, bring that product in-house. If a buyer earns low profits, watch out. They're going to take it out of your profits as a supplier uh, to the buyer. And then, um, again, electric wire and lamps. Products sometimes can be easily substituted, aluminum or copper. That was, that's what they're talking about there. Bargaining power of, of suppliers. If you supply to an industry, you have high bargaining power. Um, if, you're do if that industry is dominated by a few companies and sells to many, you have a large amount of power. Um, you have a unique product with high switching costs. I've done this in, uh, many times in my work where there's only one or two suppliers, one or two suppliers to me. And then guess what? They have the upper hand on pricing. 
I've paid as much as $1,000 for things I knew only cost 50 bucks. What's that mean? High bargaining power. Uh, substitutes not readily available. If you get into uh, uh, high grade materials or high grade instrumentation, there's no substitute. You just can't buy something else. If suppliers are able to integrate forward and compete directly with you in your line of business, they have high bargaining power. If the purchaser buys a small portion of the supplier's products, again, a problem. There's a major problem there because um, it's relatively unimportant to that buyer or that supplier, excuse me. Um, sixth force added to, to uh, Porter, relative power. Governments, communities, citizens, uh, stockholders, trade associations, unions, all have power to influence an industry. For instance, the Airline uh, Pilots Association, they have a huge amount of influence potentially on the airline industry. Uh, the reason being that they are in fact the main event. You know, I look at airlines and, and I say, what would they be without pilots? Well, you can answer that question yourself and they're unionized. So the bargaining power or the relative power of the, that stakeholder is huge and the union that, that uh, represents them. Local communities, uh, if you were to locate a, a dirty industry right next to Wingate here, uh, I don't think it would go because the local community would be up in arms they would say, no, you've got a university here, you've got a, a high quality of life, you're not going to want dirty industries located in our town. And so communities have a voice and they have power. So you've got to watch getting into industries where local communities may rebel. An example of that now is fracking, gas fracking in Pennsylvania and Ohio. It brings jobs, communities want jobs, high paying jobs, but at what cost? it may in fact intrude into the water supplies and that could be even more detrimental than not having a job. So there's this constant tension in that particular industry now caused by these power of other stakeholders. You can see if you took all those elements and then lumped them up and gave a score either low or high, you can really get a good idea of whether or not that market is attractive. This is the power of the Porter model. Uh, Porter has uh, invented this model, brought it up. He didn't invent every term, but he brought it together uh, about 30 years ago. And Porter is, the, uh, is a strategy professor at Harvard uh, University. In any case, this is a fairly straightforward approach to finding out the attractiveness of an industry. Questions? comments. Okay. If you see this on the final exam, everybody in here is going to get a hundred percent, right? Right? Okay, you're shaking your head, right? Okay. Yeah, because we still have this objective in this class, right? Everybody learns all the material, everybody gets an A if they do. Right, good. Dr. Dennis Harlow, Associate Professor in the Porter B. Byram School of Business, speaking on the subject of what makes businesses tick. If you have questions or comments about the Wingate Lecture Series, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at info.wutv22.org. I'm Dr. Martha Asty. Thanks for watching.